Good morning. Well, um, if it's your first Sunday, welcome, welcome. We're diving in this large book in the Old Testament called Deuteronomy. Last week we uh, we started in on it. Um, really, if you start reading Deuteronomy, it's uh, 30 plus chapters. We could probably spend a whole year uh, peeling back the layers of the depth of this book. However, we are just going to kind of take a, we've been taking kind of a 10,000 foot view and we're going to cover it in four weeks, huh? Come on now, come on. Uh, but wait, we're going we're gonna to dive into part two. Um, but before we do, I just wanted to kind of maybe set this up a little bit uh, grander than I did last week, but just so that we can kind of uh, squeeze as much juice out of this book as possible, uh, just kind of helping our perspective before we kind of dive in or as we dive in. Um, you know, this is the historical story of the nation of Israel. Uh, God had led them out of Egypt, and they're now all about ready to enter the promised land. And uh, this is a significant moment for the nation of Israel. Uh, but, but as we read this, you're going to begin to start noticing a few things. That the story of Israel actually has a lot to do with the story of men and women that follow God. Their stories actually begin to line up. For example, you have the nation of Israel. They were in slavery to an evil world system a.k.a. Egypt. God miraculously delivers them by a deliverer. He leads them out, and uh, while the enemy is chasing them, God leads them through the Red Sea, and the waters cut off the enemy's pursuit of them. They are led to a place that God made for them, but there's enemies occupying the land God made for them to flourish in. They cower back in fear because they don't trust God to conquer their intimidating enemies. They wander the wilderness, being fed by God supernaturally, while their love for their enslavement, longing to be back in Egypt, would finally be replaced with their faith in God. God had to starve their love for Egypt until they had faith in God. God gives them a couple big victories out in the wilderness, and they're now ready to enter the promised land, with, in which big, intimidating enemies who worship evil gods are there. But Israel needed to be reminded never to forget that they were God's set-apart people called by God. Now let me run that story back again. You and I were a slave to an evil world system, but yet God miraculously delivers us by a deliverer. He leads us out, and while the enemy is still chasing us, he covers us in the waters of baptism. And then he leads us on into a promised land, but yet that promised land has huge intimidating enemies, larger than we think, systematic level enemies. And they become be largely intimidating. And we would say, and, we, and sometimes people would say, God, those enemies are way too big. There's no way I can do anything. And so what happens in our life is God sends us out into the wilderness for us to stop loving the world and start loving God and trusting God that actually he's got his, you're in his hands. He's got you. And he's going to move you into the promised land if you would just trust him. So now God gives them a couple big victories and they're now ready to enter the promised land in which big intimidating enemies, but Israel, us, needed to be reminded that you are God's set apart people called by God. Amen? So as we kind of read through this, uh, God gives certain uh, laws and certain commands and certain regulations, much of which was covered in Christ. And so as we kind of read through this, it's like, God, open my eyes to see what message you have for my heart. And so these parallels are profound, how God guides their story, God guides our story, So this book consists of three addresses that Moses gives 40 days before they enter the promised land. Uh, Last week we covered the first message in which uh, Moses is just recounting their history, which I just did. So um, of what brought them to this point. But Moses' second address is much longer. They cover 
chapters 5 to 28. And we're going to half that this morning. So we're going to do the first part, chapters uh, 5 through 12. And uh, let's pray before we dive into God's Word. Father, we thank you for your Word. Lord, we came here this morning to hear from you, to be guided by you, to receive insight by you. And so, Father, I pray that your Word would speak to our heart. Holy Spirit, take this Word and breathe in it your breath of life. That we may be your people in this generation, mighty set-apart ones, called out to rule in a time where, God, you need us to. So, Lord, we put our attention on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so chapter 5 launches into Moses' second address. They just got their history reminded of them. Remind why you're here. Now I'm going to begin to read the law to you again. And that's the title of the book. Deuteronomy, the second reading of the law. And so here we go. Chapter 5, Moses reads the law to them again. And they're ones that we're quite familiar with, but here we go. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. There's a little misunderstanding. That means taking on the name I follow Yahweh. If you take on his name, you better not follow him in vain. It's not saying his name in vain. It's taking on his name and then living in vain. Anyway, keep the Sabbath day holy. Now, these four are the commands that man that God gives to man in orienting them towards himself, toward, orienting towards God. These is the heart disposition that God desires his people to have. No other gods, no idols, not taking my name then un- unworthily, and then keeping the Sabbath day holy, honoring God with our life. And then he gives six more, and he says, Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. That's sex outside of marriage, any kind of sex outside of marriage. You shall not steal. You shall not bear a false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. Now, by following these laws given by God, Israel would forever be marked as God's special possession, God's special treasure, special people. They were to be set apart from the other nations and the gods that they served and the culture that they brought with them to be set apart, uniquely Yahweh's people. And he goes on, goes Deuteronomy 6.1, it says, Now this is the commandment, the statutes, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you're going over, to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your sons and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that you may be, uh, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's this promise by God. If you follow my ways, you will prosper in this land. And not just prosper, but you will take possession of it. Then we come across this interesting prayer. It's called the Shema. And it is a prayer that uh, most Jews know by heart. And it was a prayer that the Israelites throughout the Old Testament prayed every morning and every night. And this is this is this command by God, this out of this promise of God, if you would just obey my ways, I will I will strongly bless you. I will strongly support you. And you will begin you will possess the land. But he says this Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This command by God 
It's a declaration of who he is, that he is the one true God, that he is the one God over all gods. He's the ruler over all creation, and that we were made to love him with our whole heart, our whole soul, and our whole might. The Shema was a direct refutation of the polytheistic pagan worship of all the nations that surrounded them. That's what it just automatically separated them. All of them were worshiping numerous gods. This true and living God is Israel's God. The Lord, Israel's God, cannot be known or acknowledged in many forms like the Canaanite Baals, which exhibited different differing characteristics and manifestations and, and rules of culture depending upon what region or land that you were in. So you could have one Baal in one region acting a particular way, and then you have another Baal that has different requirements in another region. There is only one Lord, Yahweh, and He alone is God who deals with them by a revealed, consistent, righteous standard. There's just no, there's no mysticalness to these laws. There's nothing like, oh, I, I, I just didn't know that. No, God is laying out his way. This is who I am. I am the Lord your God. I'm one. I'm not numerous like these bales of the nations around you. And so here in Deuteronomy 6, God ties love tightly together with a sense of obedience and loyalty. That when we say, I love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, it's not just that I'm mentally assenting to that truth. It's that when I say I love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, that means everything that's within me, not just in my mind, but in my decision-making and how I act out into the world. St. Augustine gave, an interest, gave interesting advice. He said, love God, then do as you please. Meaning after, if we actually think loving God, what does that mean? The parallel thought is found in Psalms 34.4. 37.4, rather. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. When you and I truly love God, we desire to do what's pleasing to him and not what's pleasing to our own flesh. This is the source, the source of all of God's abundant life. Right here. Taking delight in the Lord. Loving the Lord your God. And letting that love flourish out into your life and see the transformation that takes place. Therefore, love God wholeheartedly as his set-apart people and teach your children to do the same. Talk of his words over meals. When you're coming and you're going, let his word constantly be on your heart and mind. And he goes on, Deuteronomy 8, verse 7. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs flowing out of valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees, of pomegranates. A land of olive trees and honey. A land in which you will eat bread without scarcity. In which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron and of whose hills you can dig copper. And you can eat and be full and you can bless and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Take care. Hold on now. Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I commanded you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be filled up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Here's this overarching theme we read throughout the entire book. Remember. Remember. Don't forget. Don't relive history that you had to pay a price, your ancestors had to pay a price in blood for. Remember. Remember what God has done. Remember God in your abundance. The promised land was incredibly fertile, obviously, from the text. In striking contrast to the wilderness. Now again, up to that point, God had led the nation of Israel through the wilderness by giving them manna, which is like a bread-like substance. He dropped on them at once every day. It was only last a day. You couldn't store it up. So there was this constant reliance on God's provision in the wilderness. But yet, he knows 
There's a lot in this promised land. And when you're living in abundance, just forewarn you, you're going to be prone to forget the Lord your God, thinking that it's your own worthiness that got you where you are. God knows this about mankind. In crisis or wilderness, in, the, in crisis or when we're in the wilderness, we cry out to God. In abundance and blessing, we forget about him and abandon him and his ways. James 1.17 says, Every good gift given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadows. Every good gift. When God takes the measure of a man or woman, he doesn't put a divine tape measure around their brain to see how much they know, but he actually puts it around their heart to see how much they obey. A proud heart is kind of on fleshly autopilot. I think we know what that is. I was on a little fleshly autopilot myself this morning. Therefore, as God set apart people, don't forget God. Don't forget God in your abundance, thinking that it's all you that brought you into that place. Then Moses says this in Deuteronomy 10, Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord which I'm commanding you today for your good. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart. Sorry for the imagery, but it's deliberate. Okay? Circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribes. God is never really satisfied with mere rites and rituals and and show of religion. It demands our heart. God demands our heart and our heart's allegiance. This is why for, sir, a physical circumcision could never be seen as an end of itself, even in the Old Testament. It was symbolized something deeper, a circumcision of the heart, that God had cut the calluses away from my heart about life, my own stubbornness, my own pride, my own flesh, my own I want to be God. How does that lead us? That leads us to destitution, rectum, pity city, wherever it leads us to dark towns. Amen? Now this phrase, stiffen your neck no longer. It would be repeated in later prophets, just this tendency to be stiff-necked, to be stubborn people. Jeremiah 26, 7, 26 says, Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear. They stiffened their neck. They did more evil than their fathers. It's like, man, when we stiffen our neck, we don't just become neutral. We actually become agents of evil. And so to fulfill God's law, it takes more than just being given a command. It takes an inner transformation, a transformation that only God can bring. God commands them to do something that only He could do in them, to show them the need to have their inner transformation and compel them to seek Him for provision, wisdom, and life. There's just something about us that we have a hard time admitting. But we're broken. We're broken. We're weak. We're prideful. We're stubborn. We're like sheep. Sheep. We were talking yesterday. Man, sheep. Sheep are cute, but, man, they are stubborn. Moses might have said, stop being rebellious. Cease and desist. Instead, behave like the people of God you are. Bow to his righteous authority and pursue holiness. This call to just, when you're in the promised land, you're surrounded by all these other gods, all these idols, all these messages that says, no, pursue this. No, no, actually, if you pursue that, you'll have happiness. Actually, if you pursue this, actually, it'll bring you wholeness. And God is saying, when you're in the midst of that environment, 
You need to circumcise your hearts to be sensitive to my spirit, my way, so that you're tethered constantly, anchored constantly in my way, so that whenever you go, wherever you go, you're bringing me, you're bringing my way, you're bringing my righteousness, you're bringing my rationality to this insane world. Deuteronomy 11, we'll end with this. See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commands of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. They're here presented two choices. Joshua kind of gives him the same kind of choice at the end of his book. At the end of Joshua, choose ye this day whom you serve. If it's going to be the gods of Egypt that we came way back, your great-grandfather probably worshipped, is it going to be the gods of the Amorites that are here in this land, or is it going to be the God of Yahweh who brought you out of the land of Egypt? That word listen doesn't just mean to merely hear, but to hear and obey. Listen means to be heard so as to do. Praise God. That was awesome. Work that out. All right. Israel's heart, and every human heart, rather, really, cannot be spiritually empty. And this includes those who deceive their own heart thinking there is no God, they don't believe in a God, their God may be wood or stone, but it's an idol nonetheless. God says don't have any idols. And we in our culture, we may not have carven idols around, but we have idols nonetheless, none the same. Comfort, pleasure, money. We kind of talked about it last series, it's just the love of the world. Sadly, it only took two generations for Israel. Two generations. After they get into the promised land, two generations. For Israel to forget the true meaning of the Shema. So that the name, so that by the time the judges are in the promised land, here's what it says, Judges 2.11. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors who brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshiping the gods of the people around them. They angered the Lord. They forsook God because they forgot Him. Let that not be us, amen? Let that not be us in this generation. We too are God's set-apart people to be His light, to be His people in the midst of a perverse generation. To be His people of light. And I want to end with, by us, just reading kind of a little modified version of the Shema. Kind of took out Israel and put in people of God, if that's okay. Anyway, um, but I just thought we could declare this together. That God would remind us, that God would remind us that here, us, here in this land, that God would be our God, and that God would use us as we love Him with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, as we pass what we know on to the next generation, that he would truly be our God. Amen? Amen. So, um, I'll pull it up. Well, I'll just let you read it uh, yourself there for a second. I don't like the uh, instant regurgitation. I always like having some faith with what I'm saying before I say it. So let's de declare this Shema prayer together. As we do, I just pray that God would impart in us just this heart to never forget. Just this heart that we would learn from our ancestors, <laughs> the nation of Israel, that we too would not forget the Lord our God in a land of abundance, in a land of opportunity, that we would know where every good thing comes from. It comes from above. Amen? So let's do that. Uh, so let's read this together. Hear, O people of God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. 
And these words which I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would impart in us as you wanted to impart on the nation of Israel through Moses, that we are your called and set apart people. God, that we are marked by your word We are marked by a covenant with you. And Father, I pray that, Lord, we would be your people in the midst of darkness. God, that we would not bow to the gods of this land. God, that we would teach our children not to bow to the gods of this land, but God, to bow to the one true and ultimate king, Yahweh, the king of kings. Lord Jesus, we thank you for for your sacrifice that made all of it possible we could be redeemed and brought into your family, that you expanded your family operation through Jesus. And God, you brought in a whole large family. And Father, I thank you for that family. Lord, I thank you for the family in this city. Lord, I just pray, just even for your church here in this city, God, I pray that you would wake your people up and God, train your people. Lord, I pray just for a heart of Uh, just uh, a creative heart that would not rely on the traditions of men, but would rely upon the Spirit of God. And Lord, I just pray that over the, the big C church over our city. Father, that you would speak to your believers and that you would rise up through us to show strong what a city of believers is like. Father, Lord, we pray for your word to do deep work in our hearts. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. With that, hopefully you're diving into this book of Deuteronomy during the week. Again, it's super thick. It's super rich. Um, Hopefully you are. Um, And then also uh, in our life groups, we're diving in 2 Timothy. So kind of get excited for that. If you want, if if you're kind of new face around here and and you're just kind of like, man, how do I kind of go to the next step? Uh, Get with Michaela or me. We'd love to kind of get you tied into a life group. Uh, Because that's really where the magic is. Amen? So if you're interested in that, let us know. And uh, have a great Sunday, and we'll see you soon.